Hello, everyone. I hope you're well. My name is Ravi Agrawal. I'm the managing editor of Foreign Policy magazine, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's FP virtual dialogue, Global Lessons for a More Resilient Future, in which we're going to explore the surprising links between the coronavirus climate change and inclusive governance. Now, I know webinars are becoming very common these days, but I really think this one is special. We have a truly impressive group of leaders thinkers and activists from a very diverse range of perspectives and from around the world. I think every single continent apart from Antarctica. Now, my role today is to distill their experience and knowledge in such a way so as to make you sit up, think, and figure out how to take action on the many major problems the world faces today. So fasten your seatbelts, disconnect from everything else you're doing today and get ready to ask questions and engage with us. Before I go on, I'd like to thank the Global Futures Lab at Arizona State University, their support and thought leadership has made this event possible. You'll be hearing from some of their brightest minds shortly. A quick word about why we're convening today. We're convening because the sheer range of problems confronting the world today may seem overwhelming. Pandemics, climate change, failures in governance, global cooperation, inequality. The thing is, many of these issues are more interlinked than you might imagine. Does that mean the solutions are interlinked, perhaps? And we'll explore that and other questions about global resilience and what you can do in the coming hour. That's the why, now for how, my housekeeping notes. We want to hear from you. We want to engage with you. So we've reserved the final 15 minutes of this event for questions from you, our audience. So write us. If you're on Zoom, click on the Q&A button on your screen, submit your questions. Tell us your name, where you're writing from, and be sure to direct your question at a particular speaker. If you're joining us on the phone or via live stream, you can email us your questions. The address is events at foreignpolicy.com. Finally, for social media, we're using hashtag resilient futures for all. Let's get started. Now, before we begin our first panel, I want to get someone very special to set the stage for us first. Amanda Ellis is the Director of Global Partnerships at ASU's Global Futures Laboratory. She was previously New Zealand's Ambassador to the United Nations, so she knows all about wrangling competing agendas. And she's also played a key role in New Zealand's successful UN Security Council bid. Amanda, over to you for some headline thoughts. Thank you, Ravi. Delighted to join you today at such a critical inflection point for everyone, everywhere. The COVID-19 global pandemic has wrought havoc for humans all over the planet, exacerbating inequalities and demonstrating just how interconnected we all are. It took 100 days for the first 1 million known cases, but just six days to go from nine to 10 million cases. The governments have responded with unprecedented stimulus packages many hoping to get back to business as usual, as fast as possible. But scientists warn COVID-19 is not a black swan event. Rather, as astrophysicist Adam Frank has pointed out, it's a fire drill for climate change. We need to build back better and create a new normal to keep our planet habitable for we humans. To do that, we must call out the failure of global governance and the inconsistencies of national governments. Even though 195 countries committed to the Paris Climate Accords in 2015, the IMF data shows that two years later, fossil fuel subsidies were still over $5 trillion a year. That's trillion with a T. So crazily, we are fueling our own demise. The voices of scientists, of youth climate activists, and economists have been getting louder, but are we listening? This inflection point offers us the opportunity to pivot. We need action and we need it now. And what's fascinating on this 25th anniversary of the Beijing platform for gender equality, is that even though women head only 7% of countries, they actually account for 40% of the successful responses to COVID with six times lower death rates per capita of their male counterparts. 
So I'm thrilled to join you, Ravi, and our brilliant speakers here, as you said, from every continent except Antarctica, spanning more than three generations, to explore the linkages between COVID, climate, and inclusive governance. And of course, as you said, to highlight solutions to recover from the crisis and lessons we are learning to prepare for bigger threats ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. Those are very wise words to help us frame our discussion today. We're gonna to come back to Amanda later in the hour because she's also gonna moderate a discussion on community engagement, which is such an important part of making sure that the changes we discuss are not purely top down, but also bottom up and therefore more sustainable. Look forward to having you back, Amanda. She is of Thank course, you. the Director of Global Partnerships at ASU's Global Futures Laboratory. But on to our first segment now. I have three terrific guests joining us. Now, you are here today to learn about the links between the coronavirus and climate change, and our speakers today are experts on that very topic. I'm going to ask them to switch on their microphones and cameras as I introduce them. Uh, Amanda will switch off hers. So first up, we have Peter Schlosser, who is the Vice President and Vice Provost of the Global Futures Laboratory at Arizona State University. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Ravi. Johan, welcome. Johan Rockstrom is the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Welcome, Johan. Yes, hello, Ravi. Hello, everyone. Good to have you on board. And Shia Bastida is a climate activist and one of the major organizers of Fridays for Future New York. She has been a leading voice for indigenous and immigrant visibility in climate activism. Welcome, Shia. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being with us. I'd like to bring in Peter at this point. Peter, if you would also like to weigh in on the uh, concept of interconnectedness um, and the chart that Johan was referring to, we'll come to the other chart that I know you wanted to talk about. But if you can quickly explain to us um, from where you're sitting, why is it important that all these interconnections uh, are as important to highlight if we can go back to the previous chart, uh, just once again, um, uh, the one about interconnectedness, thank you. Um, Yo, uh, Peter, so if you can again, uh, just give us a quick sense of why the interconnectedness between them is an important thing to highlight. Um, so Ravi, what uh, Johan started to explain is that we are actually putting pressure on the planet in different domains. It's not just that we are putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which raises the temperature. We also are putting pressure on water, on the water system. We are extracting too much water. We are acidifying the ocean, which puts pressure on, for example, corals, the functioning of the biological systems. But we are also putting pressure, not just on the environmental system, but on the societal systems. So wherever you look, we are actually increasing the pressure on the natural capacity of the planet to carry us, but also on society to govern itself in a way that would allow us to go onto a trajectory towards a future in which future generations, the younger generations, have the capacity to shape life as they want this to happen. And what this graph shows is in some of the areas, the nine areas that Johan referred to, we are already in the red zone. So we have actually exhausted the buffer capacity of the planet to take the pressure that we are putting on it. And it is sort of almost screaming at us, you know, relieve the pressure. Otherwise, we might get across thresholds, across tipping points, and this might lead to crises or catastrophes. Right. Thanks, Peter. And I should apologize for the... Uh audio issues with Johan. He's jumped off to try and resolve it. And we'll bring him back later so we can hear more from him. But Peter, let me continue with you for now. Um, and that other chart that we saw a glimpse of very briefly, I'd like to bring that up now. Because um, the problem is that many of these threats um, that you just described, they are also exponential in nature. Um, and that means that they can get progressively worse uh, at a very rapid rate. Um, can you explain again the importance of understanding uh, exponentiality? So tell us what's on the chart we're now looking at and why that matters. 
So for a long time, since uh, people have been on the planet, of course, they interacted with the life supporting system, with the environmental system, they made use of it, and they tried to live uh, in a way with them that allowed them to sustain them and to support them. What you see in that graph, and at the bottom you have the timeline, you have uh, the, the years from about, uh, you know, you see 200 to 2000, so about, uh, you know, almost uh, the, two millennia back um, and for a long time we were in a fairly quiescent uh, period. This is showing the temperature. So one sector is being displayed here, climate, the temperature that goes with it. And it, it fluctuates. Nature always is a complex system, always goes up and down a little bit, but it, it fluctuated in a fairly small range. Then if we are looking, let's say at the beginning of the industrial revolution, if you're looking at around 1800 here on that graph, all of a sudden the you know, human activity is accelerated greatly. And that expressed itself in the production of a very rapidly rising amount of greenhouse gases that goes into the atmosphere. And as has to be expected, it led to a very rapid rise of temperature. We could put other variables up there like water use, like uh, droughts, things like that. And we would see that we have an increased occurrence of these events. And just to highlight that very quickly, it's not just temperature that we see as an effect of climate change. We also see, and if we just have to look at 2019 and 2020, as far as we have gotten into that, we have an increased number of extreme events of different kinds and different parts of the planet. And just to highlight the uh, wildfires, we had last year wildfires in Alaska where we didn't see them before. We had uh, Brazil burning, we had California burning, and then to end the year we had an inferno in Australia. We hardly got out of that and went into the COVID-19 shock. And now we already, while we are still trying to grapple what all that means, we do have wildfires again in Alaska. We have in Arizona, the largest wildfires we have seen. So th this is going on, that pressure is going on and we have to figure out how to learn from these events with respect to planning for the future to get on a different trajectory. That's right. I wanna bring in Shia Bastida. Shia, um, you uh, are obviously uh, an organizer of Fridays for Future. You've often been called uh, America's Greta Thunberg. Um, but just when you look at these kinds of graphs and this information and the stuff that Peter said, are you angry? Um, I mean, the short answer is yes, of course. Uh, what I'm seeing coming from an indigenous background, I think that's why it's so clear to me is that we're not living in balance. We're not being able to actually um, have the relationships that we need to have with the natural world, understanding the interconnectedness of the issues. Because as we have seen with COVID and climate, both are affecting vulnerable communities first, frontline communities, often communities of color, as seen in New York City, um, where the Queens and the Bronx are the most affected. And in terms of generational inequality, climate change is gonna affect youth the most, but COVID is affecting people with pre-existing conditions the most. So there's always different groups that are uh, in the front lines of that crisis, um, but there's no system to protect all of us as, um, as there should be. And I think that what the youth have learned about the COVID crisis is a lot about messaging. Um, we've learned that, you know, saying that it's here, that it's happening, is obviously much more, um, it works a lot better than saying, you know, the climate crisis is gonna happen in a hundred years or in 50 years, because it's that psychological um, reason that we need to act. And we've learned about global solidarity. What I do here is going to affect the rest of the world, which is what happens with the climate crisis. Um, we have learned about the ability of all sectors to mobilize to address a crisis. Now, uh, private companies, governments, you know, they cannot tell us we cannot mobilize to solve climate change because we have seen it. We have seen that people are listening to the science more than they like seem to listen to uh, with climate, the climate crisis. Um, but in both cases, we need more people to actually look at the facts. And we as kids, we're trying to 
um, communicate the science in the most effective way possible to reach large numbers of people. So, so Shie, uh, um, Shie, if yeah. I may, um, there's no doubt in my mind that you have made political leaders sit up and listen. Um, but I want to ask you beyond that, how do you force them to change policy? Um, for many of your cohort, um, you can't vote just yet. Hopefully you will be able to very soon. Um, but what tangible actions can you take to force policy, to push the needle on what actually gets changed? Um, I think that youth have an enormous role to play. Uh, one of the first things we did in New York City before we were able to actually galvanize thousands of people to strike was, you know, I testified at City Hall so that the city would declare climate emergency. I lobbied for the Dirty Buildings Bill and the CLCPA, which is the Climate and Leadership Community Protection Act. Uh, when policymakers see youth lobbying for things, when they see us showing up, when they see us, you know, trying to mobilize the youth vote, um, that has a huge effect on who their target population is and what the issues they care about should be prioritized. And I should point out that Fridays for Future is present in over 150 countries around the world. And we all strike at our local governments because we know that, you know, if you can't change the world, none of us can just like change the world, but we can all change our own communities. We can all change our own towns, our own cities. So we emphasize um, striking locally to have a, a bigger effect globally. But we also, you know, are present at COP25, we're gonna be at COP26 to push policymakers, not only at the local, but federal and international level. And it's working to some extent, so I, I hope you keep doing that. Peter, let me bring you in. Uh, we're still trying to see if Johan can join us um, because of his audio issues. But um, while we're waiting, Peter, um, give me a sense of, you know, the, the coronavirus has at the very least focused global attention on a single problem uh, in the short term. It has led to some extent to cooperation, to the sharing of information on best practices, on healthcare, on vaccinations and more. Does that mean rapid action on other problems such as climate change or other issues is possible? And if so, how do we do so? So what the COVID-19 situation tells us is that we actually can mobilize, and that has already been mentioned, significant resources in a very rapid, on a very rapid time scale. We also know that there are similarities with, let's say, climate change, because both of these phenomena are globally uh, distributed. They are emerging on a global scale. And there is, there is no limit you know, that would prevent it from spreading from one country to, to another. The hope that we have to have now is that the investments that are made at a massive scale will be used to drive the re-emergence from that shock towards a point, towards a trajectory that is better than the starting point that we were at when COVID-19 hit us. So from, from that perspective, there is a chance to actually pivot in a fairly short period of time. The key question is, will people make the right choices? Will they use that chance and will they divert this, these resources towards a trajectory that's better? And I see, you know, movement in both directions. There are, there are elements of global society and its governance to push us as fast as possible back to the starting point, to get back to functioning in a normal way to sort of get out of the negative effects that we are all going through right now. There are also a lot of voices that say, let's use that opportunity and push ourselves away from the starting point to a re-emergence point where we are much better off, where we are using the investments with some conditions that would drive us into a new trajectory. My hope is that at least to a certain extent or a large extent, the latter will take place, that we will re-emerge at a better point with all the suffering that we are going through, but that that price that we are paying will lead to an outcome that gets us to a trajectory that is better than the one that we were on before COVID-19 hit us. Let's hope so. Um, I'm gonna have to close this segment for now, but Peter and Shie, 
um, you're going to join us at the end of uh, our event so that we can pose questions from our viewers to you and also Johan, who will hopefully rejoin us by that stage. Thank you both of you so much for your thoughts uh, and Shia, your very inspiring message as well. Um, look forward to coming back to you. As a reminder, you can ask questions to uh, all of our guests by clicking on the Q&A button on Zoom or by emailing us at events at foreignpolicy.com. Thank you once again to Peter, Johan, and Shia. You can go ahead and switch off your mics and your cameras. Lots more ahead this hour. Amanda Ellis will be back, of course, for her conversation with Maxine Burkett and Maya Satoro from the Institute for Climate and Peace. But before we get there, we have a different segment focused on inclusive governance and greater gender equality. And to key that up, we have a special video for you. Let's watch the clip. In 2015, every United Nations member state made the commitment to ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership. This builds on previous international commitments like the 1995 Beijing Platform for Action. The rationale is not just equity, fairness and rights and representation, but also because it makes for stronger governance and better economic outcomes. The diversity dividend is well documented. In the private sector, more women in senior managerial positions and on boards correlates with an increased return on investment. In governance bodies, gender balance correlates with increased emphasis on long-term growth drivers like environmental sustainability, education and health. So with such a strong case for gender balance, what's the current state of play? One in four parliamentarians is now female. Only one in five speakers of parliament or government ministers is a woman. And less than 7% of country leaders are women. In the private sector, almost one third of companies globally have no women at all in board positions. A new index provides some insight. In a survey of 10,000 respondents in 2019, more than half expressed discomfort with women as leaders in both corporate and political life. So with progress this slow and challenges persisting, what works? Some dire statistics there, um, but lots to chew on. So let's discuss. I'm going to ask our guests to switch on their cameras and their microphones now as I announce their names. First up, we have the Right Honourable Helen Clark. She is the former Prime Minister of New Zealand and the former Administrator and Chair of the United Nations Development Programme, UNDP. Welcome, Helen. Thank you. We have Martin Chungong. He is the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, the IPU. Welcome, Martin. Thank you. And Augusto Lopez Claros is an economist and the chair of the Global Governance Forum. Augusto, welcome. Happy to be with you. Thank you. Well, welcome to each of you. Thank you for joining us. You're all on different time zones. So I'm especially grateful to you for shifting your dinners and your breakfasts to be here. Um, Helen, uh, it's early where you are in New Zealand. I'd like to start with you. Um, 2020 marks 25 years since the Beijing Platform for Action on Gender Equality. And yet, as we just saw, women lead only 7% of the world's countries. And interestingly, as Amanda pointed out at the start, this tiny fraction of countries that are led by women account for a disproportionately high number of countries with a successful response to the coronavirus. Talk us through that correlation, if you will. What does it mean and why are we still where we are? I think on average, the women leaders have done rather well in managing this ghastly crisis. Of course, there are also male leaders who've managed well. And where they have, they've shown a lot of the, the traits uh, that the women leaders have. But to me, the mark of the successful leadership, which has been exemplified uh, with the four of the five Scandinavian PMs who are female, with Angela Merkel, with Jacinda Ardern, in my own country, there's quite a list of these women leaders who've, who've performed extremely well. What have they shown? They've shown 
firstly, a, a set of values that puts human security, people's health, absolutely first. They've got the message that if you blow this uh, public health response, you're going to have deeper and more protracted economic woes. So they don't buy the argument, it's the economy that must come first. No, no, people come first. There's a proverb in my country, uh, in Indigenous people's language, Māori, that says, what is the most important thing in the world? It is people, it is people, it is people. So that's the number one thing. But they have also uh, then shown empathy. They have communicated uh, transparently and openly. They've told people the, the, the facts as, as, they, as they see them. They have been prepared to listen to advice and use good judgment. You know, not all advice is good either. So you've got to have the judgment to know uh, what is valid and, and what isn't. And I also feel that uh, among the group of women leaders we're discussing here, there's not a lot of ego. There is a, a, some humility to say, we don't have every answer. We have imperfect information, but we're going to be guided by the set of values that our people's health matters most, and we will do whatever we can. So that to me has been at the heart of the successful responses. And then Helen, if you can explain the disconnect between what you're describing of women who have all these qualities to be able to listen and better lead. And yet organizations and citizens who feel that they would be uncomfortable being led by a woman. I mean, that, that set of statistics we saw in the video was truly shocking and bizarre. Oh, it, it is quite, quite shocking. And when you break it down by, by country, uh, Germany, which has had a phenomenal woman leader for years and years and years, there are still, uh, quite significant proportions of people in Germany who don't really see women as, uh, as, as fit for the job. So we are dealing with, with straight out misogyny and it has to be uh, tackled uh, head on. And I think for, for those of us who have been in the tiny group that ever got to, to lead our countries, uh, taking on a really a lifetime mission of encouraging others to come in, to stand their ground, to build the networks, to be supported, uh, to, to climb that staircase that leads to leadership. That's very important to me. Indeed. Well, I want to bring in the others as well. And I should point out, we have several hundred people joining in to listen to this. For each of you, we want to hear from you. So do send us questions. Uh, you can use Zoom Q&A or you can email us at events at foreignpolicy.com. And we'll put your questions to each of the guests. Um, who are joining us at the very end of this event. We really want to hear from you. So do weigh in with your thoughts and your questions. Um, Augusto, let me bring you in. Um, the moral argument for gender e equality is obvious, um, but if that wasn't convincing enough, there are clear economic and political arguments supporting it as well. Now, you've written a book about this very topic, uh, equality for women equals prosperity for all. Um, very briefly, can you explain the economic rationale for gender equality for the people who aren't convinced by all the other reasons why this should be the case? Um, thank you so much, Ravi, for the, for the question. You know, um, one of the things that is encouraging over the last 20 years is just the very rapidly uh, accumulating body of empirical work that has been done that shows the the benefits for society of the economic and political empowerment of women. And let me just mention, uh, you know, uh, sort of half a dozen of some of the more interesting studies that have come up in, in, recent, in recent years. There was a survey done in uh, the United Kingdom a few years ago of 6,500 companies um, looking at the composition of the board. And basically what this survey shows is that those companies that have a greater participation of women on the board are less prone to uh, uh, corporate governance scandals involving bribery, fraud, uh, and other, other such uh, uh, factors, which depress uh, business and consumer confidence and therefore negatively affect economic growth. Um, under the leadership of uh, Christine Lagarde at the IMF, they have done a, a few studies, which again, emphasize this very, very point focused on the financial sector, a higher share of women in, in boards is actually associated with greater financial resilience. Um, of course, uh, Amanda already mentioned in, in, the, 
in the clip, uh, the evidence that has accumulated over the participation of women in corporate boards more generally, uh, particularly in respect of uh, higher return on equity, sales, invested capital, and so on. Within the household, a number of studies have been done which show that when women work and join the labor force, um, the income that they contribute to the family actually leads to a, a kind of a shift in the political power with a distribution between the family. And women who are more empowered actually have more of a say on how the resources are spent. Uh, when this happens, uh, we have discovered that much more resources are allocated to education, to health, uh, which of course then you know, helps to build up human capital over the longer term. And then not to overwhelm you with the data, let me mention one final, one final aspect of this. Um, as of today, um, more and more countries are adopting uh, quotas for parliament as a way of accelerating the political empowerment of women. And the data that is coming out of looking at those two sets of countries, those with quotas, those without quotas, is really quite fascinating. What we're discovering to start with is that those countries that have introduced quotas have actually higher labor force participation rates for women, which of course, other things being equal is good for economic growth. Uh, furthermore, what we're discovering is that in, uh, let's say, at the level of village councils in India, where quotas uh, have been established, um, the political empowerment of women leads to more investments in those infrastructures that actually contribute to the, uh, improve the quality of life within the community. I could go on. Uh, the, the, it, I, what, I, what I find uh, very, very encouraging is just the overwhelming body of evidence that is building up, which basically suggests that we pay a very heavy price in terms of human prosperity and security by marginalizing women and by dis discriminating women. See, uh, it's really important that you say all of these things, uh, Augusto, because uh, the data is important and these examples are important because you know, clearly the, the pure moral uh, imperative has not worked so far. Um, so it, it, one can only hope that data and real examples and other imperatives uh, work on these measures. Martin, I'd like you to weigh in on these very points. Uh, you've worked in Cameroon's National Assembly. Now you're the first European to run the IPU, an organization that was created to advocate for democracy and to arbitrate between countries. Um, but many of the countries represented at the IPU uh, don't seem to take gender inequality seriously enough. So what role can global institutions such as yours and national parliaments play in reducing the gender divide? Yeah, um, uh, thank you very much. And I must say that uh, I do share the views that have been expressed by uh, uh, Augusto and uh, Amanda. When women are at the table, outcomes are better. And you've asked me what we need to do. Uh, I think that we need to be addressing the barriers uh, to women's political participation. We do know that uh, there is uh, what Helen called misogyny, which is very rife. Uh, we do know sexism is uh, very rife, but you also have uh, harmful traditional practices that occur in certain parts of the world. So uh, I think that if we want to improve upon a women's political participation, then we should be looking at how a parliaments uh, frame the legislative framework in such a way that it is conducive to women's uh, political representation. And August, Augusto mentioned one mechanism, uh, quotas, for instance, that are, have worked to uh, push up uh, the women's uh, uh, representation in uh, representative institutions. So I, I think it's important, but for international organizations, it's also very important that they be seen to be walking the talk. And I, I would take the Interparliamentary Union, for instance, and we, I happen to be uh, the chair of the global board of the International Gender Champions, which is a network of uh, leaders of international organizations and diplomats dedicated to promoting gender equality. We should be setting some standards that we want to hold ourselves by. We should also not only advocate, but also institute a system of sanctions. And at the IPU, we are sanctioning 
uh, those countries that are recalcitrant, that are reluctant to comply with gender equality norms. They're losing uh, voting rights uh, in key decision-making uh, uh, events. And so we do think that you need to wield the carrot and the stick in order to achieve uh, what we want, that is women being at the table. But let me point out also that we are talking about inclusiveness, we are talking about representation, not only in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality, which means that when women are at the table, they should be given the opportunity to actually make a difference. And we have ample evidence out there that where women have been given that opportunity, there has been a difference. We look at the uh, caucuses of women parliamentarians that have been established in many countries in the world. They are very useful for forging cross-party alliances on key issues of health, education, jobs, uh, something that I think is a good example of how these women can come together and drive change in parliament together with their male folk, because I think it is important that there be that partnership between the two. So at the end of the day, it's not only a moral imperative to have women at the table, it makes a sense in terms of outcomes. Indeed. Um, Helen, just building on this, how do we make it more politically viable for governments and global organizations to put into practice some of the ideas and suggestions, the carrots and sticks that Martin and Augusto are putting forward and that you've already mentioned too. It's clear from this discussion that inclusive governance makes for better leadership. How do we make it happen? Well, as Hillary Clinton once famously said, uh, gender equality is not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And uh, Augusto has set out uh, you know, the facts about how, how much better uh, for example, in the commercial world, companies do if they have a, a, a better gender balance. And, and, and what a surprise. You know, if you have more women on your boards and your senior management, they just might be more attuned to half the population uh, that is female than those boards who, who pay gender representation no account at all and have very few insights into women as users of, of goods and, and services. So if all else fails, you know, go for the economic arguments. But I, I think uh, in the area of political uh, decision making, uh, the question is, do you want quality decisions? Do you want women at the table, again, bringing their perspectives, uh, their unique insights into the way society works, the, the needs of, of women? Women also, you know, I think rather more attuned to the, the needs of children because disproportionately, no matter where in the socioeconomic scale women are, they disproportionately take more care of children, aged relatives, family members with sickness or, or disability. So they do bring different perspectives to the table. You want good decisions, well-rounded decisions, you'd better ensure that, that women are there. And of course, we can also apply that uh, across the society where there's underrepresentation. You know, are the LGBTQI groups uh, represented in, in our decision-making bodies? Are Indigenous peoples represented? Are ethnic minorities given a, a, a voice? You know, are, are remote rural regions given a say? If we don't see in decision-making ourselves reflected as, as, as a society, and we're all diverse societies, we will be the poorer for it. Our decisions will be worse. They'll be less well-informed. Indeed. I, I want to jump to a couple of other topics, but before I do that, Helen, very quickly, um, what would you like to see more of in male leaders? What can male leaders do better? I think uh, really reflect on what it is which is making this remarkable group of women leaders effective. You know, empathy doesn't come naturally to everyone, <laughs> but people can try harder to empathize. Uh, stand back and reflect on whether ego is getting in the way of you taking advice which you might not want to hear, uh, but which is a very, very important. Think about how you're communicating. Is it a one-way broadcast or are you inviting people to come uh, on a journey with you, uh, which will keep the, the community uh, secure? And then think about your values. What are you in leadership for? Is it about people for you or is it about you? I think these are some fundamental questions about leadership style, motivation, and purpose that, that every leader 
uh, male and female should be asking themselves, and particularly right now. Indeed. And as you say, invite people to come along on a journey with you. I see lots of questions coming in. Uh, it's Q&A, uh, the Q&A button on Zoom or events at foreignpolicy.com. Let me jump to a couple of other topics um, while we have time. Um, Helen, again, um, so much of what we're discussing today boils down to a failure of global governance and an organization such as the UN Security Council, which you've dealt with, doesn't come up too well. Um, what marks would you give the UNSC, for example, uh, for its performance in addressing the coronavirus? The Security Council on addressing COVID-19 has to be given zero out of 10. It is missing in action. <laughs> and the only point it, it's visible is to record yet another failure uh, to reach agreement. It, what a contrast with 2014, when the Security Council, faced with the threat of Ebola, uh, declared it to be a threat to global peace and security and urged all member states to do whatever they could to address this threat. The Security Council has been unable to agree on such a resolution this time. There's been a lot of name calling, a lot of geopolitical polarization, which is still in the way of people coming together to do what they ought to do. Now, uh, then there was an attempt to have a resolution which backed the UN Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire, uh, end of hostility, so that all warring parties around the world, and there are many of them, could focus on fighting the pandemic. The Security Council couldn't back that either. Because in the resolution, there was a reference to uh, supporting international organizations, including the specialized health ones. And one particular great power, of course, had just declared war on the WHO. I mean, th this, this is truly pathetic. I think the G20 also needs to step up. I've been part of letters uh, going from former leaders to the G20, setting up the action that's needed from them, representing 85% of the world economy to stump up so the international financial institutions get the support they need uh, to help the more than 100 emerging and developing countries which are asking uh, for emergency support at this time. Uh, they haven't stepped up yet, but there is you know, an indication at least that, that some governments within the G20 get it and want to move their peers. Again, the precedent is 2009, isn't it, when the G20 rallied to stop the global economy going over the cliff uh, with the, the global financial crisis. And that's what we face if we don't have timely uh, support now for the economies which are in deep right. trouble uh, because of COVID. Right. Martin, I saw you raising your hand uh, earlier. I'm sorry I didn't come to you then. Um, uh, so uh, if you have uh, a point you'd like to make, please go ahead. And while you're thinking of that, I just also wanted to ask you, you know, given how we're talking so much about competing agendas of various countries, as someone who sits at the head of an organization that sees those competing agendas every day, for example, autocrats who might not see it in their best interest to have a more equal society, how do you solve for that? Uh, well, the thing is, um, we, we, uh, the, our organization is member driven, and so you'll have all sorts of interests, of, as you're saying. But I think that there are a set of common values that we share. And uh, those are standards that we agree together to hold ourselves by. Democratic standards that include respect for human rights, equality, inclusiveness, and all of that. And so even those uh, so-called autocrats are uh, duty bound to comply with these uh, standards. And what we need to do is to forge a coalition within the organization of the willing, the coalition that will defend the foundational values of democracy and develop standards that uh, are homegrown, that is members of, for instance, the uh, parliaments that are members of the organization can come together around certain standards that they themselves have evolved. And uh, we can then apply this across the board or encourage those who are reluctant to come on board. And uh, we have seen this during the pandemic where parliaments have been at the forefront uh, in many countries of the global effort to fight uh, the virus, the, the pandemic. And they have been keen to share their experience with those that are functioning under more challenging uh, circumstances. So there's sharing that is important, sharing of common values, uh, implementation, using a bit of uh, uh, friendly pressure 
on some of these regimes. And I have uh, in recent uh, weeks uh, rung that bell, I'm warning that uh, this COVID uh, should not be a pretext for autocrats to grab power. And I have called for a lifting of the lockdown on parliaments because some people are using extraordinary powers today to bypass parliaments. And it is parliament, parliaments are more needed today than ever. The need to oversee the exceptional powers that governments are arrogating for themselves, the need to provide the resources for the policy frameworks that are being put in place in order to fight the virus. So uh, rather than saying we're going to bypass the vital institution of parliament, we should be strengthening its hand in order for it right. to be more effective and make sure that the efforts that are being uh, deployed are more effective. As a journalist, uh, uh, Martin, I have to agree with you uh, on the point that autocrats are using the coronavirus to expand their um, strongholds over populations, especially when you look at media freedom around the world and how that has been endangered in the last three months. Augusto, I'd like to bring you in as well. Um, you know, we're commemorating the 75th anniversary of the UN Charter right now. Is there one UN reform that in your view is feasible or doable in the current environment that would force the organization to be a more effective instrument of international cooperation? Um, you know, Ravi, I'm reminded of something that Albert Einstein said in 1947. He was referring to to the General Assembly and the supporting institutions of the UN system. And he said something to the effect that the moral authority of the UN would be considerably enhanced if the delegates were elected directly by the people. So there has been a debate over the, over the, the, the next several decades about how to strengthen the democratic legitimacy of the United Nations. Um, and one of the proposals that have been put forward over, over time by the likes of Grenville Clark, uh, Einstein himself, uh, other people, was to, to basically move to a, a system of, uh, of uh, um, sort of representation in the, in the General Assembly where countries' participation would be linked in some way to some objective criteria, population size, GDP, a membership share, some, some such idea. This, however, would require amendment to the UN Charter. And therefore, as an interim measure, uh, a number of experts have proposed uh, 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 the, the, the creation of something that we could call a World Parliamentary Assembly that would be complementary to the, to the General Assembly. Um, it could be established under Article 22 of the Charter, which gives the General Assembly uh, the authority to establish subsidiary organs. Um, I align myself completely with these ideas, and I think that there are many, many benefits that one could identify. We think that if you were created this, you were to create an assembly that was largely advisory to the to the General Assembly and to the to the um, Security Council, you would basically have elected representatives which would represent individuals in society rather than states. They would not vote along nationalities. One can imagine that there will be coalitions that would likely form uh, around, that would be issue-based, coalitions working for climate change, for human rights, for gender equality, rather than their national interests, which is what happens today you know, within, the, within the, the UN system. They would be better able to promote international cooperation. They would see problems in the world through the lens of humanity's interests rather than the lens of national sovereignty. Right. And more importantly, in this age in which we see rising militarism and you know, vast spending in our military industrial complexes, you would see what Richard Falk a few years ago said, um, uh, we would move away from a, a war system in which international decisions are still made by heavily armed nations, um, as he put it, bent on destroying each other. So we think that this is one, one area where we could get some quick benefits. It doesn't require UN charter reform and uh, you can limit the authority of this World Parliamentary Assembly to, to basically having initially an advisory role. And I think it would precipitate massive uh, catalytic change in terms of the willingness of the system to introduce reforms for the longer term. 
Well, I'm sure we have at least some uh, people from the UN listening into this call. We're almost out of time here on this segment, um, but I'd like to ask one last question, uh, and I'm going to put that to Helen. Um, and Helen, I'd like you to put on your old UNDP hat for a moment. Um, one of the primary reasons for a lack of trust in leadership uh, and a global, broader global mood of protest and anger, I think, um, is that there's growing global inequality. Um, and this was an issue that you focused on a fair bit uh, when you were at the UNDP. What went wrong? What can we do more now to reverse all of these trends that we see around the world? I recall a, a report on inequality which uh, UNDP issued uh, about eight years ago. And uh, one of the points it made was that the, the, the greater the inequality, uh, the less likely it was that political systems would do anything about it because oligarchies had in effect captured power and weren't going to give it up. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, the slide to greater inequality, of course, in, in developed advanced societies uh, also worsens the chances of getting anything done about it because the more marginalized people are, the, the less voice they have to do anything about it. But this is a recipe for disaster. This is a recipe for spillover. It's a, a, it's a threat to, the, to any hope of social cohesion, uh, peace and tolerance. And I just say to, to leaders who see these trends in, in their societies, wake up and smell the coffee. What do you want your legacy to be? You want your legacy to be a divided society, not at peace with itself, where people live on the margins without hope, or, or do you want a better future for your country? Reflect on that. And if you don't, uh, the chances are forces are going to well up and come, come after you because it's not tolerable. So wake up and smell the beans. Thank you, Helen. I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up this segment now. Helen Clark, Martin Chungong, Augusto lopez Claros. Thank you so much for your time and wisdom today. You can now turn off your mics and your cameras. Um, we could have continued this conversation forever, um, but we will have you back uh, at the end of this event um, to answer some of the questions that are coming in from our viewers around the world. Um, we, uh, if you still want to ask questions, type them into the Q&A box on Zoom, or you can email us on events at foreignpolicy.com. So time now to welcome back Amanda Ellis from the ASU Global Futures Lab. She's gonna switch on her camera and mic back on. We've already looked at global governance, leadership and decision-making from the top levels, but now we want to shine a light on communities and how transformation can and is being activated from the bottom up. Amanda, over to you. I know you have an excellent panel to guide us through the next part of our event. Thank you, Ravi. And Maxine and Maya, if you could please unmute and turn on your videos. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Maxine Burkett and Dr. Maya Sotoro, distinguished scholars, educators, and community builders. And they are both co-founders of the Institute for Climate and Peace. We heard a lot about the Security Council in the previous session, and finally, they did put climate and peace on the agenda in 2019, but you have both been pioneers in making these linkages. Can you tell us why you co-founded the Institute for Climate and Peace? Thank you, Amanda, so much for doing this and to all of you for your participation. What an incredible, powerful and committed group of people. And um, I wanna say on a personal note, the reason that I felt compelled to start the Institute for Climate and Peace is in part because uh, of the incredible person in Maxine Burkett. I would do anything with her. She's so brilliant uh, and, um, and, and doing such good work. But we basically uh, came together realizing the value of braiding the tools of climate justice and positive peace building. Uh, I was a peace educator and uh, we could see that climate crises are um, more likely to trigger violence in many societies and especially in societies that exhibit divisiveness or ethnic exclusion. But we could also see that old conflicts have stopped or been transformed in order to address flooding, water scarcity and other disasters. And so climate justice work can offer a powerful impetus for uh, compassion and nonviolent communication and collaboration that has lasting effects in building the beloved community. And if we bring the two disciplines together to inform one another, we can positively impact both. 
And so what we wanted to do was to bring uh, education, collaboration, policy transformation, all desperately needed, um, to uh, young people and people uh, of every age, leaders who lead from behind, beside, and beneath, uh, to support the development of uh, environmental peace builders um, in every corner and to confront the universal threat of climate change in a multifaceted way. And, uh, you know, all of uh, climate change and, and, and pandemic and, you know, this, they're threat multipliers. And what this means also, though, is that uh, there are multiple points of entry. And if we work together um, uh, to solve these problems and, and contribute to our shared ecosystems, global commons, and beloved communities, uh, we can make a lot of progress together. Plus, I didn't want to live um, or act out of fear, and that's what climate change was doing. So um, this work enables me to um, transform aspiration to action and to encourage action in others. Maxine, to you. Yeah, thank you, Maya. And uh, yeah, this has really been a, a, a product, product and a labor of, of love for us. Um, for me, I do a lot of work on climate migration and the so-called you know, climate refugee crisis. And it seemed that the, uh, the conversation between the peace world and the climate world was really about security. It was about, in some cases, boots, boots on the ground and, and sort of traditional notions of peacekeeping and not really looking at some of the root causes of, of conflict mm -hmm. or looking at the ways in which we could sort of transcend um, some of the typical uh, cleavage points and think about issues like borders and migration um, with a spirit of welcome rather than a spirit of exclusion. And so what did that look like? And so, you know, as you were talking, I've been working in climate justice for uh, my entire career. And as I grew to understand positive peace and conflict transformation, which is at its base, that is very much a climate justice um, consonant kind of approach. We're looking at root causes. We're understanding that the acceptance of rights of other people, equitable distribution of resources, good relationships with neighbors have positive dividends in, in the moment, but also in creating resilience to various crises. Uh, there's data out there that make it very clear uh, in terms of natural disaster, countries that have higher uh, positive peace uh, scores are actually also experiencing far fewer, exponentially fewer um, uh, uh, suffering and deaths as a result of natural disasters. So there's a built-in resilience there that is also a much more enjoyable day-to-day -day life. Resilience is such an important concept. Thank you both. Maya, tell us a little bit more about the role of education in mobilizing change in communities. You have so much positive data. And we had a question from Donya Faridizar about the role of education. So tell us more, please. Yeah, certainly. So I'm a lifelong educator. I've, I've taught in the middle high school, uh, uh, undergraduate and graduate levels. and. Um, Really, I see education as leadership development. Now, in terms of education at the intersection of climate peace, it may look a little different. Um, it's often place-based, it's culturally responsive education. It's filled with indigenous wisdom, but also has a futures perspective and, and focuses on innovation. Um, there's a sense of, of belonging to community. So it's education that is often uh, connected, uh, in connecting school, community, and families, includes a sense of wonder and awe, curiosity, and imagination, like all good education, of course, that explores mentality or wayfinding mentality that uh, enables us to courageously look beyond the known and peer into the unknown. But um, it is uh, vital that um, we see education as a means um, to, um, amplify this work beginning at a very young age. Um, the truth is that uh, we need to wash our eyes and, and refresh our gaze. The COVID crisis has certainly shown us that. Uh, we can operate differently. That things that seemed inevitable really aren't. That in fact, if we uh, push uh, uh, ourselves that we can do extraordinary things together. And, and uh, this is also, of course, a different kind of leadership. It's integrative, it brings people in alignment. Uh, with the environment and raises the potential in others and looks holistically at creating um, well-being, environmental, cultural, social well-being, um, uh, you know, guided by principles and practices that really allow us to care for others, um, that, you know, and, and listen to others and, and include others. Um, but I, I think that the, the problem is that at a certain age, um, we uh, tend to become entrenched and sort of accept that things are 
um, as they have been and, and, and change is difficult. So we want to target uh, people of every age and believing in lifelong learners, um, we um, value the possibility of growth that these crises uh, pr present, in fact. I love this notion of wayfinding because we are very much sailing over the horizon with no fixed point of reference with regard to both COVID and climate. And so the idea of leadership, uh, education as leadership development is I think a beautiful one. And of course you point out leadership at all levels. I know you both live in Hawaii where climate change is having a very visible impact, but we are in fact seeing some positive solutions emerging at the local level. I would love it if Maxine and Maya, you could both give us some examples just to close out the segment on positive approaches to these issues. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. I Hawaii has been a sort of ahead of the curve and a lot of the work that we're doing uh, to ensure climate resilience, but also to be very responsible for our own contribution to the crisis. I think it's really important to remember that um, all along people have wanted energy. They haven't necessarily wanted fossil fuels, right? Um, and in fact, if we understand the full impact of fossil fuel extraction to combustion um, and its disproportionate impact, we can recognize that in fact, our lives, lives would be better collectively uh, if we were, had, would have made that shift some uh, at least 40 years ago, as long as uh, we know that uh, many of the main companies have known. So Hawaii is committed to both the Paris Agreement. We were one of the first localities um, in Honolulu, uh, specifically uh, the state as well, to recognize the commitments of, of, of the Paris Agreement, even if the national government had, had uh, stated its intention and, and has followed through on its intention to pull out of the Paris Agreement. Uh, we have, we were the first state to introduce 100% renewable energy by 20, renewable electricity, excuse me, by 2045. And that has actually been now the, uh, the, the, the marker of action across the country. And a number of other states followed suit and also introduced 2045. We do know that we can get there faster and cheaper before 2045. But that, of course, is um, our, our sort of our benchmark to work towards and, and hopefully surpass. We also have embedded in our system, our state constitution, uh, uh, Supreme Court cases, state Supreme Court cases, and understanding of a right to a healthy environment, uh, atmosphere, water, etc. These resources are critical to uh, human uh, life and non-human life, all life in fact. And we've seen recent decisions that are, uh, for example, requiring life cycle uh, analysis for our determination of, of the, the right fuels to use, right? And that's actually helped us with dealing with um, natural gas, for example, as as is often uh, suggested as a bridge fuel. It's not a, a solution and we want to accelerate our renewable energy uh, progress uh, quite quickly. At scale, we know that it's critically important that local communities are fostering social cohesion so that we're resilient after, after storms, for example, or other extreme events. We also know that zoning and land use and uh, other kinds of adaptation policy programs are critically important to do right now because we are today seeing communities suffer from the impacts of, of sometimes century old uh, sort of racial exclusions, for example, and, and land use and zoning that have disproportionately impacted communities' ability to remain resilient to he heat events and other kinds of uh, extreme, extreme weather. So it's critically important that as we make these changes, uh, Honolulu, the state of Hawaii, is thinking very clearly about how to introduce the best ways uh, of, of living uh, sustainably and uh, peacefully moving forward. And great to see these kind of examples have a multiplier effect. Uh, Maya talked earlier about the threat multiplier, but there's also a positive action multiplier. And it's great to see 24 states in the US are now still in the Paris Accords and over 100 million Americans are covered by commitments to renewable energy by 2045. So these kinds of positive actions that Xie referred to at the community level can have a multiplier impact. I know it's time to go to Q&A, but Maya, I would love to turn to you for a final thought on what our viewers might do themselves. We had a lot of questions in the Q&A. What action can we all take at a personal level to help move this agenda forward in a positive way? Well, I think that part of the reason Hawaii is doing well is that uh, we uh, have strong community and many of you too have strong communities. You have communities that are um, able to work 
generously together with courage and a sense of um, awareness. Uh, we need public um, participation. Now that's different from political participation. Political life is important, but many people who don't participate in political life are powerful contributors to public life. Um, they can demonstrate uh, moral leadership and encourage the upstanders and um, face th the fear of this time with wonder and courage, uh, helping others to confront um, a sense of hopelessness um, through art and, and, and movement together. Um, we see that, um, you know, we can, of course, um, help uh, support um, environmental defenders, but we can also, um, in terms of our individual actions, choose a more minimalist lifestyle, change our um, economic uh, impacts. We can um, think about, um, you know, more planet-friendly choices, in other words. Um, of course, individual actions, when the system has not been put in place to support them, um, you know, are, are difficult uh, sometimes in terms of uh, seeing an impact, but really the two aren't mutually exclusive and they have to work in tandem. So when you have individual choices leading to systemic changes and, um, and, and sustainable changes, um, that's truly powerful. What I would ask for um, all who are attending is, um, you know, to ensure that yes, you engage in advocacy, that where you are able, um, push for big investments in clean energy and emission reduction and carbon capture, you know, as scientists or um, as people involved in industry, um, change the culture, wash the eyes and, and uh, choose to see things differently um, so that we, uh, you know, but also if you want to uh, work to support uh, farms and fish ponds, um, you know, hydropower, um, we can uh, do so much uh, uh, to protect our coasts and to dig up invasives and um, to educate others, but also to um, think about um, binding together uh, through uh, community uh, mapping and uh, preparations and sustained dialogue, a sense of resilience that we spoke about. So beautiful. Um, yeah. Meg, I know, I think we need an entire webinar for both of you, but that's a perfect note on which to end and move to our Q&A. This whole idea of individual action leading to both sustainable and systemic change. And that's exactly where we want to go. Ravi, over to you. And thank you both, Maxine and Maya. Thank you so much, Amanda. I really learned a lot from uh, you and this discussion. It was really fascinating. Um, all of you, please stay on with us because we're now gonna take questions from our viewers around the world. Hundreds of them have stayed with us through uh, the last hour and 10 minutes or so. And we're gonna take about 10, maybe 15 minutes to go through some of the questions they've sent in. I will pose them to specific speakers. So I'm gonna ask all of the guests who've been on this event so far, please go ahead and switch on your cameras and your microphones once again. And I'm gonna direct questions at you very shortly. Uh, if you still want to get your questions into us, you still have time, it's the Q&A button on Zoom, or you can email us at events at foreignpolicy.com. Remember, our hashtag is hashtag resilient futures for all. Okay, let's go. Um, the first set of questions I'm going to put to Shia. Um, I have one from uh, Chip Comins who says, how can we more fully support the views of Shia and the global youth climate movement to include them at the sovereign decision-making table? And then um, Chao from Belém in Brazil also asks Shia, what would be the key strategies for organizing communities toward the kind of local action you defend. Shia, over to you. That's a double question at you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the question. Uh, first of all, for how can we make youth, um, how can we include youth at the decision-making table? I think that this has to be done in a variety of different places. I think that panels like this are an example of how voices of youth can be included in the conversations that we have every day because what I say, maybe you're gonna go and tell your colleagues, but it also goes into how can we be participating in internships of businesses uh, as, as youth who can comment on, um, on how the businesses can move forward with a climate lens, or we can do the same thing in politics because 
you know, youth are uh, right now rising up on every, almost every front of activism and we are connected amongst ourselves. So whatever youth you bring who has an activism spirit, they will lead you into the right direction in all these different, um, you know, kind of events and atmospheres. And for the second question, which is, um, you know, how can we have a more impactful uh, presence in government and in our own cities? I think that we are already doing that, but obviously the pandemic, um, you know, we used to strike for climate. We got 7.6 million kids to strike around the world on September 20th. And we cannot do that anymore because we want to respect each other's livelihoods and health. But that doesn't mean that we're still not there. We're still not trying to participate in events like this. Uh, but coming forward, I would, you know, ask all of you to check in with the youth in your lives as to how, with all the amazing work that you are doing, how can you educate the youth in your life? How can you learn from them? How can we open spaces of intergenerational dialogue, which is the essence of indigenous uh, communities, youth and elder circles in which youth learn from the wisdom of elders and, you know, elders learn from the new perspectives of youth. Mm. So it is about dialogue. It is about being present. Wise words from Shea. Um, let me put a question to Helen Clark in New Zealand. This one is from Deborah Ray, who is a female federal employee in the United States uh, by her description. Um, and Helen, the question is, what can women do to positively influence perception that women provide benefits to organizational leadership structures? From Deborah Ray. Well, it's it's kind of putting a burden on women, isn't it, to say that we have to prove ourselves yet again. There, there are so many role models of effective women's leadership. We might be relatively smaller numbers in a lot of decision-making theatres, but uh, you know, overall, I think because the, the women have had to campaign so hard to get there, uh, you're, you're often seeing you know, really outstanding people come come through those systems. So what I would say is, is, is point to the successful examples. I think uh, COVID definitely gives us a range of those. Uh, let's be clear, not every woman leader has, has done well, but a lot have. Uh, so let's hold that up. It, and it has been noticed. I've been amazed at the global coverage uh, of the, the way in which uh, the, this, this lead group of women uh, heads of state and government have, have handled the, the pandemic. Uh, I, I think also just you know a, appeal to to people's uh, sense of reality that if, if you don't have women's voices at the top table, what sort of decisions are you going to get? Whether you're a company, um, whether you're a, a parliament, a cabinet, a, a, a professional organisation, a trade union, environmental group, whatever it is, you are missing something very very big if women's perspectives aren't there. Truer words were never spoken. I want to bring in um, Peter Schlosser. Um, and uh, the question uh, is from an anonymous uh, viewer today. So this is probably a failing in my part uh, in not having explained this properly. So the question, Peter, is what is the Global Futures Laboratory? What are you hoping to achieve? And how are you working on shifting the trajectory of the planet? Peter Schlosser. So the Global Futures Laboratory is a university-wide structure within Arizona State University with the aim of understanding the present state of our planet to imagine what kind of future states are possible and importantly to figure out what options do we have to shape that future to not just react to problems not just problem solve but also anticipate problems and head them off before we have to grapple with them and the, what is needed to do that is to draw on all the disciplines that the university and academia in general has to offer so that we are able to create a holistic picture of where we are, where we, are, where we came from, and where we can head and actively find solutions, actively shape our future with one important aspect, and that is recognizing the urgency. This is not something that we can contemplate as we typically do in academic settings for a long time and ponder it. We are actually 
dealing with a clock that's running out very fast. Mm -hmm. And we have to make choices that are different than the ones that got us into that pressure situation that the planet is under. And that needs to also make sure that we are looking at academia in a different way, meaning paying the right attention to the role of social sciences and humanities in addition to natural sciences, engineering, and, and all the other disciplines that we have available so that we really can draw the right picture, a holistic picture, and that we are solution-oriented, response-oriented. Solutions-oriented is a great thing indeed. Um, Martin Chungong, um, if you can unmute yourself, um, I have a question for you from Zane Gustafsson, um, and she asks, that as an experienced diplomat on the international stage, what kind of changes to global governance structures do you see as necessary for combating climate change? And to what extent is US leadership needed for such an effort, Martin? Well, I, I think that uh, the, the question that has been uh, raised is uh, that of uh, the utility of multilateralism. And if we look at the global response to many of the challenges that we have had to contend with, I could say that there is an indictment of multilateralism. And so what we need to do is to reform uh, the institutions that embody or are supposed to articulate multilateralism, starting with the United Nations. It needs to be more inclusive. It needs to be more responsive to the, the challenges. And uh, again, when the United Nations was founded 75 years ago, you did not have some stakeholders who are present today on the world stage. You didn't have civil society. You didn't have young people as such. You didn't have science and technology as we know it today. We should, in the international environment, fashion a more effective way of bringing in these stakeholders. And this brings me to the question, the issue that was raised by Augusto, the creation of a World Parliamentary Assembly. Short of creating an institution that has teeth, that could uh, make laws, could effectively hold governments to account, I think that we are dealing with a piece of expensive gadget. What you need is uh, institutions or an institution that can mobilize parliaments around the world around those issues that are on the UN agenda, an institution that would act uh, at arm's length from the United Nations and be able to articulate the real voices of the people represented by parliamentarians. What is also more important is to make sure that at national level, Parliaments are doing what they should be doing, holding the feet of their government to the fire, making sure that what is being articulated in New York uh, on behalf of member states is actually uh, consonant with the real interest of the people. And when the decisions come back to the national level and they are uh, asserting to have uh, complied with the needs of the people, then parliament needs to put in place the policy framework needs to hold government to account to implement to those commitments. So I think that the work starts at home uh, before it gets to New York. And uh, you, we need finally uh, multilateralism that is more inclusive, that is more representative of new stakeholders. We can no longer see multilateralism only in terms of member states, member states meaning representatives of the executive arms of government. We need to bring in the new other stakeholders. And I think that is what the IPU, the Interparliamentary Union, has been advocating for a long time now. So a more inclusive multilateralism. We're almost out of time. I have a question for Augusto. Um, Augusto, if you can unmute yourself, I'd appreciate a quick answer. This one is from Erin Powell. She's a student at GW, George Washington. Um, and she says, while gender quotas are important, I worry about who the women who get elected are. How do we address the gap of gender parity in governance while also addressing class and wealth gaps in governance? In other words, how do we get more women at the table that are more representative of the vulnerable women they represent? Augusto. I think that one of the, one of the problems that we have faced over the last uh, many decades is that uh, Politics has not been especially attractive uh, field of endeavor for women. Um, I lived in, in Russia in the 1990s and I was always very, very puzzled by, on the one hand, the great capacity that you could see among women in science, in 
in business and other areas of activity, and yet they were you know, not present in the, in the corridors of power, so to speak. And speaking with some of these women, um, you know, very often the thought would be put forward that, well, politics is a dirty business and, and therefore, you know, better left to men. And I think that we have, we're dealing in some sense with the legacy of that, of that attitude, uh, you know, over the last century or so. However, um, it seems to me that when we actually look at the kinds of qualities uh, that have been exhibited by women leaders in the context of the COVID crisis, um, it's very eye-opening. What do we see? We see the prioritization of, of human security and socioeconomic well-being instead of the sort of traditionally militaristic approaches to national security that we have seen over the past century among men. We see approaches that are based on science and empirical evidence um, we see a great deal of diversity, inclusiveness, humility, transparency, flexibility, and we see a great deal of emphasis on international cooperation. So it seems to me that um, by um, in, in sort of boosting and encouraging the integration of women into, into a political, the political, political arena, parliaments, governments, cabinets, and so on, we are going to begin to benefit from the, the uh, approaches that they have taken, um, you know, to managing global problems. Sounds good. Um, Amanda, I have a question for you from Ian Tay. And he says that you earlier said that there needs to be a change in how local and national governments act. However, from your experience in the UN, is there something that could change in how inter international institutions act as well? And what would those changes be? Thank you, Ravi. And I think as the, the second segment put it so well, there's really been an absence of the Security Council, an absence of the G7, and some tinkering around the edges of, with regards to the G20, as Helen pointed out. Many of these institutions related to the UN, the, the Security Council, is a post-Second World War initiative, and many countries have been suggesting that there needs to be reform. I think when you listen to Martin and the importance of the very inclusive multilateral system, uh, you can guess where I come out on that. Uh, so my personal perspective is we absolutely need international reform and we do need to get rid of the veto power at the Security Council and have a much more representative Security Council. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Peter, I have a question from Julian Kitching um, for you. And his question is, how do you assess the long-term impact of the coronavirus, including misinformation surrounding the virus on the rise of populism globally, Peter? That's a, a fairly broad question because it cuts across that present situation that we are, which is sort of a shock that we had to expect. As somebody, I think it was Amanda said, it's not a black swan event. It's, uh, and there will be others that will follow that. We just have to learn from this one to be better prepared in the future. But that of course is overprinted by a general trend of too much information out there to be digested. And a lot of that information targeted at misleading or let me rephrase that, targeted at making a point that certain people want to see dominate rather than focusing the use of information to get to, to shape the best way forward. So what hopefully will happen is that this crisis that we're in right now that was triggered uh, in the health sector that then rapidly mm -hmm. showed us through how interlinked everything is, how the world can come to a almost still stand, at least to a big reduction in, in productivity, that this wakes us up enough that we are thinking about not just how do we prepare for these kind of health-driven events and crises, but also about the state of the world in general. What kind of measures do we have to put in place to take the pressure off most of the, the systems that are comprising the earth system, including societal systems, so that we are not getting into the situation that was raised in one of the questions, which is, you know, if we are 
putting too much pressure on the planet, it starts to self-regulate. And one of the preferred methods that mm -hmm. probably will be used is disease. So we better use that insight that was put upon us and wisely chart our way forward to be more prepared, to look at more buffer capacity, resilience, whichever way you want to use it, and to think about what are the limits, coming back to the first slide, what are the limits of the planet on which, with which we live and have to live and we have to leave options for the generations of the future to shape their own life and to thrive on that planet. Whatever those limits are, um, it seems like we're close to them. I have one last question. I'm going to put that to Helen Clark. And since um, I work for foreign policy, um, the question has to be about geopolitics. So Helen, this one is from Aria Sains. Um, and she says, um, the US has slowly become more divided over the past few years. And she was wondering how that affects its role in the global community and relationships between allies. I'm, I'm not sure that it's the internal divisions per se uh, that are affecting its geopolitical positioning, but the country is incredibly polarized. And so we, we see these lurches. You know, if you just think to recent years, we go from you know, the kind of inclusive presidency of Bill Clinton to uh, to George W. Bush, the, the pendulum swings back to the inclusive approach of Obama, and now we have the you know, quite extraordinary uh, phenomenon of the of the Trump presidency, and these lead to different kinds of positioning geopolitically. I was at the uh, UN uh, throughout the Obama years, and of course, you know, while you know, the U.S. foreign policy, uh, one, one could take its issues with uh, from time to time. Nonetheless, it was committed to playing a, a strong role in the multilateral system. And I believe President Obama got it, uh, that it's not enough just to be, you know, the, the world's only superpower. You can't achieve anything unless you work collaboratively, which, of course, was the insight that led to first the League of Nations and then to the, uh, the approval of the U.N. Charter it itself, uh, but now we have this, uh, you know, very odd performance where uh, the one superpower also is pretty much missing in action, except to be uh, rather destructive uh, at the at the Security Council. Not the only one, by the way, uh, but uh, it it is disturbing to see the U.S., which has been a you know very strong founding uh, member of of the UN, uh, one by one knocking over. Uh, multilateral agreements and uh, defunding core organizations like the WHO in the middle of a pandemic. So look, I, I believe the pendulum will swing again, but I think the reflection in the US must be uh, what could be done uh, to overcome the deep divisions in the nation. And I guess it might start with looking back at history. The George Floyd killing, of course, has brought to the fore the tremendous legacy of, 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 of slavery. Uh, never been an apology for slavery that, that, that I'm aware of, about time there was, uh, so many uh, inequalities. And use the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, uh, the institutions that you have in the US to address these issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Helen. Uh, I'm sorry to have to end it here. Um, it's been a truly fascinating and insightful conversation. I learned a lot. And for those of you who've been watching through the last 90 minutes, you can see a recording of this discussion on our website, foreignpolicy.com. I really want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today and sharing truly interesting perspectives on all of these vital issues. Um, they have joined us from time zones spanning New Zealand to Hawaii to Germany and Switzerland and several time zones within the United States. So thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise and your time with us today. I also want to express our appreciation again to the Arizona State University and its Global Futures Laboratory for their wonderful partnership. And thanks to you, our audience, um, for joining us today. We value your support and your questions, uh, which were very smart. And I hope um, you managed to listen in to some of the answers to them. I'm Ravi Agrawal, Managing Editor for Foreign Policy Magazine. It's been a pleasure hosting this event. Please stay tuned for lots of new virtual dialogues here at FP coming up in July 
and into the fall, we'll be posting updates and more information on foreignpolicy.com events. Thank you, stay safe and be well.